Okay, did you all find out something interesting about each other over the break? Yeah? No? You didn't utilize it to network? Uh, where'd you all find the drinks? Okay. Excellent. All right, so is everything as clear as mud to this point? <laughs> All right. So again, to continue on in the book, um, we are on page 1410. Just to reiterate again, the pumping level, what happens when the pumps start to work. Um, pumping level is with the pumps are on, and the drawdown is the difference between the two as far as your well supply operations. Water levels can be checked with the tape, the airline, or an electric sounder in your well. Which one do you think would probably be a little more, or a little better? Electric sounder. Absolutely. With the uh, tape, Sometimes it can be difficult to know when it actually has reached the water, surface of the water. Um, so any of those methods can be used. It can be okay for shallow wells, but in your deeper wells may be an issue. When you have changes in levels, again, it could be an indication there's a drop in that water table. Um, there could be some stoppage with the screens or damage to the pump. So that's to help alert the operator. They need to start the investigation process to determine why your gallons per minute or levels have dropped. Now, in order to remove the water from the aquifer, we utilize pumps. The most widely used pump is the submersible pump, which is a type of, is it a positive displacement or is it a centrifugal? Centrifugal pump. <laughs> it is one of the most widely pumped that we use in this industry because it can work well over a, a wide range of operations there. Water generously enters the eye of a centrifugal pump and it's spun out with centrifugal force to the discharge side. And as long as you have the proper size pump, you're going to get the gallons per minute, long service, uh, very low maintenance when it's properly sized. Of the centrifugal pump, we have the submersible, which is widely used for groundwater wells. We have the vertical turbine, and we have, uh, they can be set up in series. What we mean by series, and I don't have a writing board, I guess my writing board is behind there, is we have different bowls or impellers set up in series. Now, when you set up a pump in series, does that increase the gallons per minute produced? No, it does not. What, what does it produce or increase? Pressure. Pressure, very good. So centrifugal pumps are the ones that are most li widely used. Uh, again, they can be classified as turbine or volute uh, pumps. Parts, we have the shaft, which is the only moving part. We have the impeller. The shaft turns the impeller. We have the suction. Um, we have the volute, which is the casing that houses the impeller, which is the rotating element. And as we said, it's one of the most common pumps that's used in our water industry. The impeller is housed in the spiral-shaped case called the volute. And that shape of that volute plays a very important role in producing, again, the pump characteristics as far as the pressure and all of that. Velocity head is the energy required to get the water moving. Pressure head is the force in PSI. With the turbine pump, the impeller is surrounded by a diffuser vane instead of a volute. And as the vein tr transfer the velocity head into pressure, then that converts it to PSI and feet. 
And this is normally used in well operations. They can be deep well pumps or vertical turbines. They can be oil or water lubricated. With the line shaft turbine, again, you probably see these quite often in well situation. That's when the motor is on top instead of submerged. Um, the pump is in the well connected by the shaft and it must be installed in the straight hole. Now, when we're using any type of lubrication with any um, things that we're dealing on the water side, it must be a food grade. Why food grade? Because people are going to eat it. Absolutely, that's our drinking water source. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure it's not motor oil because there is a possibility of this oil being transferred to the water. Matter of fact, if you've ever done any inspections or gotten up there on your ground storage tank and looked in, there may be a fine sheen on top. That's oil. Okay? So you want to make sure it's food grade. Your impellers can be adjusted to regain loss and efficiency. Now, how do we go about determining what's the best pump for our situation? Rely on the engineer, huh? And we work with what they give us. <coughs> but if you had a say-so in it, what would be some of the things that you would look at? Very good, gallons per minute pump. Excellent. What else would be a factor? I think you would want to look at space, too. Space capability. Where will this pump be mounted? Will it be a submersible? Or am I going to, again, have a, a building where I'm going to house my pumps and motor and work off of a suction lift rather than suction head? That's going to be critical. Excellent. So the characteristics of the water will play a very important part in pump selection. So I've looked at all of that. I've listened to the engineer. I've gotten the right pump. It's in place. Now, the placement of that pump becomes critical because if I'm placing that pump where water can flow in by suction head, positive flow, I'm going to minimize the possibility of cavitation. What is cavitation? Which can be a major problem, huh? Run out of water. Run out of water. Now I got these air bubbles starting to collapse and causing that peeing sound and vibration and eventually can cause all kinds of problem loss and efficiency. Major problem. But as long as I'm maintaining suction head or positive suction, not an issue. That occurs when the center line of the pump is below the water supply. If my pump, however, is located above, center line of the pump is located above my water supply, now that is referred to as suction lift. I got to do a little more work. And let's say I start getting air in that line. Now the air gets into my impeller, causes all kinds of problems, pitting away of the impeller, loss of efficiency, and overheating, and so forth. So the position, for as most as possible, I would want again where my supply is above the center line of the pump. Okay. So these are the parts of your pump, and as we said, we can have various stages in order to increase the PSI. Uh, the purpose of the bearings is to reduce the friction of the returning, rotating shaft, help align and keep that shaft in place so we don't have shaft whip and all of that. The purpose of the impella is to draw the water in to move the water. And again, these are set up in a series here. Uh, with your inline booster pump, we have a short couple line shaft turbine. Again, motor is located on top, um, coupled with the shaft. And these, again, are set up in series.
With the submersible turbines, both the motor and the pump are submerged underwater, um, will work in a cricket hole, unlike with the other one where you have to have the straight hole because alignment of that shaft to that motor and pump is critical. But here, both your motor and pumps are beneath the water or submerged in the water. What's one of the disadvantage of this scenario? Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of time out of sight, out of mind. How much maintenance are we doing in that situation? Once it tore up, got to get it out. Uh, motor is cooled by the water and it reduces the cost over other types of pump. Very solid operation, but again, very little to no maintenance is done in that scenario. And they're so just installing one. Huh? On average, how long will one of your pumps It depends, again, on how many gallons per minute you're pumping, uh, whether or not your screen and gravel pack is intact, and the characteristics of your water. Normally, it's three days after the water goes <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah, they say that yeah, it's a lot to do. That will decrease the light, yeah. So you will refer back to the manufacturer on that, and hopefully it's not three days after the warranty. <laughs> That's about it. Okay. Now. Those were just pictures of them putting and it in. Every probably quarter horsepower you go up is lots of dollars. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine. So when we are sizing it, do we want one that's higher or lower horsepower than what's needed? Always more. Always more, absolutely. Kind of reduce the load on that. And I always picture a horse with a load, reduce the load, always go above what it's slated for. All right, so the various methods to treat groundwater. Again, if you look at the rules um, mandated by EPA, disinfection is not even a required treatment process. That's the reason I ask, what does your state require? Okay, if you look at the EPA rules, it says to disinfect as necessary and I'm like oh that's an odd way so it's left up to the state agencies or the territories to determine whether or not it's necessary to disinfect groundwater did that not change with the groundwater it's still as necessary and we can look at the rule itself but that language is in there as necessary now when you start having issues and failing those coliform tests. Now, in addition to going back to the distribution system, getting your repeats, what are you having to do? Go back to your source water and pull from every source water that was in production on the day you got the positive to check your source water too. And I guess based on that, then you will determine whether or not, because the water quality parameters, whether or not that's crucial for you. Yes, ma'am. We've always chlorinated in Kentucky on groundwater, just mm -hmm. you know, a blanket across the board. But then when the groundwater rule came in and there was that log removal requirement. Right, the 99.99 or mm -hmm. the four log inactivation. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that that changed it for other states too because it didn't have as large of an impact on us because everyone was already chlorinated. Chlorinating? And you've got systems that can't meet that and they're mm -hmm. still on the And then what other states have chosen to do in order to achieve it, some of them have gone with the disinfection. That is one of the compliance options, but they also employ other mechanisms of treatment such as filtration in order to achieve the 99.99% reduction. 
And so they just do different things. We were, was it you and I, Bart, that was talking earlier? And I mentioned to him Delaware was one state that it's not required. There are some systems that disinfect, but it's not blanket across the board where disinfection is a requirement from the state agency. So it just depends on the quality of the water. And that's what we keep going back to based on the characteristic of your water will mandate your treatment schemes that are out there. Uh, additional uh, treatment schemes that may be necessary, if I have a problem with gas, what gas? Can have all kinds of gases. What are some common ones that you encounter? We don't really have that issue around here so much, but uh, Very good. in the coal pr producing regions and mm -hmm. oil gas regions, there's a lot of methane. Methane, okay. No hydrogen sulfide, no rotten egg smell from the water. A little bit. A little bit. Some, some of them. Okay. So if you have issues with gases and things like that, even with iron, aeration works wonder, you know, to help oxidize that iron for removal. And so other treatment schematics could be aeration, corrosion control, and we'll talk about these in detail. Uh, softening, and then there may be other special processes if I have arsenic. Any arsenic? Uh, when's the last, when did your last CCR come out? Okay, so they're scheduled to be out at least by the 1st of July or the last of June, as you said, to every homeowner. On your last CCRs, did you have any hits with anything? On well, the last CCR, but for some reason, which I think is loud error, we had a detection on violence. Okay. Never have before and have it since on the quarterlies, and you know, so I think it was loud error, but what do you know about it? And did you ask? What did they say it was coming don't from? Know don't know where it came from? I think it was lab error. Yeah, I don't think there's any way. I mean, then silings like uh, uh, petroleum, mm. petroleum products and stuff. I mean, there's nothing even remotely but, close know, to that. It could, be as, it could be something as simple as the bottle that you used. Or know. what was on a lab tech stone when you touched it. That's what I'm going with. It could have. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you know, I, I just, I mean, none of the historical data shows any levels at all, and then the quarterly's after show none, but all of a sudden we're just like way up here on one test. On one test, and you all research all the lab? Xylene. So one of the things in, in your investigation, and I know you're saying you're questioning the lab, that you asked them to produce at the time all their blanks, their standards, their way of verifying that the information was credible. No, so, because it's like, well, uh, you, you just go to the increase. Well, and if you do, they're going to show you all their QA. Yeah, and that's that just, again, to build your confidence back up, because I would hate for you to have lost confidence in this lab and you're still using oh, it. I've lost confidence in both of them around this area. <laughs> okay. So you can request and ask to see that information just to verify the data. Now, once you're on the increased frequency in monitoring, is it possible to ever get back to where you were before? Well, I have to With the report the second quarter to the and then mm -hmm. after that. Okay, you make I that request. Okay, so I just want to make sure you knew how that you can get back to your lower frequency and it is after you have demonstrated for so many consecutive months that it's okay, put in the request in order to be reduced back. So you're not at that level continuously. All right, excellent. And so really it didn't bother that bad except it's a violation and then you got more to do in the CCR, which is a pain in your Yeah, and that public notification. No, go ahead. That's what class is about. Go ahead, Mary. Uh, you, you have to do public notification for your 
Yeah, but no CCR guy, what's his name, Rodney Ripperger, mm-hmm. he said uh, I have to do that. I have to, I have to do a public notification for it. Under, under the new publication or the revised rule, there are three tiers of notification, 24 hours, um, and then you have the... Um, yeah, tier two, and what's going on in my mind now is keeping the states separate from EPA, because as I go from state to state, they may be a little different. So with the initial tier ones, it's 24 hours. It's a 30 day for tier twos, but the CCR can serve as the tier three, which may be the notification that he's referring to. I'm not sure where the xylene falls up under, but even with that tier three, you have a 12 month period to get that information. But any exceedance must, the, the public must be notified. Did you get a violation? So, so it was an exceedance, huh? Yeah, but it, yeah. it was a violation for getting exceedance. So. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> It was kind of confusing to me, but I was kind of, you know, I've been trying to get the CCR done. And mm-hmm. I don't know. At first, he told me that it was for not sending in the results. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, if, if the deal knew you didn't get the results, how did you know I had an exceeded? Well, let me check on that. And then when he called back, it was, okay, well, it was because you got an exceedance is the reason you got, you know, but the violation was because you didn't send in the results for four consecutive quarters. I said, my first quarter hasn't even ended yet. How can I send in future results? Well, let me check on that. It's just been this. And when you look at EPA rules, you have 10 days. You have to report within 10 days following the monitoring period. Right. But the violation yeah. was because I hadn't turned in four consecutive quarters after the exceedance. It's only Which one hadn't been. Since the yeah. So how could I turn in four consecutives? Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. <laughs> that hasn't even happened yet. Is that because that was convenient, right? We're going to get some things done for you yet. <laughs> Um, special process could be as simple as coagulation and sedimentation. Again, when you look at surface plants, this is something that they typically do anyway. With coagulation, a chemical is added because, again, turbidity particles are so small and some are so collodial, they're not going to settle out. They're too light. So you add a chemical which attracts them. Turbidity particles are negatively charged. Usually you're going to use an oppositely charged chemical. Alum is widely used. Your ferric um, salts can be used. Um, so opposite, positive, negative, does what? They will attract. Now they form sufficient weight. They've coagulated, form sufficient weight to form flock. And now the flock will settle out sedimentation. And then that can be fall- followed by filtration. In some cases, that can work almost as well as reverse osmosis for some uh, things. Uh, Reverse osmosis. So let's look at each of them individually. With aeration, uh, aeration can help remove objectionable gases. It can even aid in the removal of iron and manganese. Any iron problems in this area, region? Yeah. Where is it coming from? Is it naturally occurring? Yeah. Okay. And so what, how do you all usually remove your iron? Aeration. Aeration is used? Okay. Cool. Oxidizers, polyphosphate, sil- silicates, those are used? Excellent. A- aeration will scour the w- waste gases such as hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, and ma- methane. And generally, you're going to get an improvement in taste also with the aeration, with the removal of those gases. Hydrogen sulfide, very, very toxic gas, heavier than air. Um, It smells like rotten eggs in small concentrations. In large concentrations, you're not going to smell it because it deadens the sense of smell. Very toxic. 
<laughs> Not this one. Well, I guess by that time, because the concentration would be so high, you don't smell it. This one, you can smell the small concentration. Now, if you get to where it's not smelling, that's when you're in serious. 0.25% of this gas will kill you. Yeah, it's, it's a very it's deadly. Out west, and that was a huge issue. Yeah. Out so where is that treatment plant? This is a treatment plant in Texas. And is, is that all gas coming out of that, those variations? Mm -hmm. What kind of gas? Whatever they're dealing with. And what kind of air permits would you have to have? <laughs> oh my God, that's crazy. You know what? In, in some, for our anaerobic digesters, and this just floored me, in some regions with the anaerobic digesters, the methane, instead of burned off, it's just released. Just released. And it's like, where's your flame? They don't zing you for that. And, it's and just released. Why would you not? I mean, to me, that is such a, a hazard, a, an explosion hazard. Uh, that just mm. would freak me. Yeah. But even the wastewater treatment plant runs, uh, our diesel engines run their pumps and their pipes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Can't yeah. use it for that. So that's hydrogen sulfide H2S. Carbon dioxide is uh, also heavier than air, and it's an asphyxiant, okay? So whenever you are around these gases, if you're working in and around confined space where these gases are, you want to make sure you have the right breathing apparatus. Uh, methane is the only one up here that's lighter than air, so it'll be at the elevated areas there. There is no telltale sign like carbon dioxide. It is odorless, it is tasteless, it's colorless. So no telltale sign that it's present. Very explosive. Aeration will change your soluble compounds to insoluble compounds. So aeration, excellent, excellent way to remove gases. And generally, if you have a gas problem, that will probably be your first form of treatment uh, to try to remove the gas is aeration. Corrosion is another problem that we find from state to state to state. So it's another problem here too. Um, where does corrosive water come from? Huh? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> How does groundwater become so corrosive? Picks up those minerals. Picks up all those minerals and stuff that affects the pH. What is pH? Yeah, the potential hydrogen ion concentration. pH scale goes from 0 to 14. 7 is neutral. Seven is where we want most of our water to be. Seven is ideal. When that water is below seven, usually it's an indication that it is acidic. Above seven, then it is basic or alkaline. But it's the below seven that's the issue, especially when we have naturally occurring minerals and things like that that can reduce the pH. Oh, coupled with disinfection, which further does what? <laughs> Add more acids to it. Now we have created a possibility for the water to become corrosive. Okay. Are there any health, um, definitely not benefits, but health issues associated with corrosive water? Ah, oh, so now I have the possibility of lead and copper. Lead does what? Huh? Dumbs us down is, is the way I put it, because eventually it does impair our mental 
um, capabilities, physical capabilities, copper. Gastrointestinal disorders, okay? Lead also causes high blood pressure in adults, so there are a lot of things that are associated. Lead and copper, corrosive water, so it's a, a major issue there as far as providing that product that is beneficial to our customers. When we have more than one metal, uh, two dissimilar metals, it may also cause health effect depending on what the dissimilar metals are that's causing the corrosion. So it can be a major problem and not just an aesthetic thing. When a lot of people think of corrosion, they think, oh, you've turned my clothes orange or brown, so who's going to pay for the laundry? No, it goes beyond that can also leave a, a metallic taste. So there are lots of issues associated with corrosive water that we have to look at and make sure that we're dealing with. But the pH is an only indicator of balanced water. No, it is not. No. Because I think from the Langler index, oh, I was he went to there. Find about an 11 pH, which is In order to get stable water. Uh, so you, you're using that in index. Have you ever looked at the Bayless curve? Bayless curve? Okay, Bayless curve is a lot easier because with the Langler index, you got to do what? I need the pH, I need the temperature, I need the hardness. There are five things. What else did I get? Alkalinity, yeah, I need that one with the Bayless too. There's another one, which, what did I not say? There's like five different things. I said pH. Salt, total dissolved solids, I think, yeah. So I got to run all of those in order to use that indicator there uh, in order to see whether or not my water is scale forming or corrosive. With the Bayless curve, all I need is two things, and that's the pH and the alkalinity. And then plot that on that curve, and it'll give me an indication of where I'm falling. Um, what's your alkalinity like? Because you said you needed a pH of around 11. To make the water balance, I guess. Mm. You know, but, uh, you know, I don't run it daily. I can't remember. Okay. Because that's, pH, that's so yeah, that's, that's not um, a test that we typically run on groundwater. Um, but if so, that could give you a very, a visual indication almost instantly based on where you fall on that curve. So No, you're just not having to do the other analysis, so it's, it's more of a process tool for the operator. Right. But to I, show what him. I'm getting at is it's not realistic to run pH of 11 something just to make the water balance. You know? Yeah. So it's kind of hard to say where to, you know, just call it, if I got the pH at 7 by adding him. So now I need to look at some of the other things that may be making the water corrosive because generally, if I have corrosive water, generally my pH should be under 7 is the general rule of thumb there. So how do you spell Bayless? Um, B-A-Y-L-E-A-Y-L-S-I-S. -S. Did I get that right? And if I didn't get that right, I'll get it to you in a minute because... It's either on this slide or another slide. Oh, okay, cool. Sorry. Why pay less? Yeah. Um, the water can be corrosive because of low pH. Uh, dissolved gases, as you all said, water is a universal solvent, so a lot of stuff dissolves into it. High temperatures. How hot is the water from your aquifer? About 50. About 50? Around here. Okay. Here. Pretty low, yeah, low. based on the ambient temperature, and if so, 10 degrees or 2 or 3 degrees oh. warmer, but not much. In, in Texas, in some areas, we have very hot water, whereas it has to be cool before we can disseminate it out. Out of the ground hot? Yeah, it comes out of the ground hot. Hmm. Out of the ground hot. The is what, about between 50 and 54 degrees? Mm. Yeah. Okay. So you don't have that issue there. High mineral levels would be another uh, 
reason why the water can be somewhat corrosive. So when you look at stabilization or adding chemicals, you look at the question, well, what is considered stable water? And that's where we want to operate is in the stable water realm here. Uh, corrosive water can be very detrimental, we've already said, to your health in a lot of cases. But what is it doing to those pipes that are not plastic pipes? Eating them away. So now that's job security, huh? Does somebody got to get out there, that wrap on in order to keep it going. Stable water is that water, and that's where we're trying to get to. When they're, um, stable water neither tends to be corrosive nor scale forming. Now, scale forming, we said that occurs when the pH is very, very high. Have you ever seen a tree ring? The rings of a tree that indicates the age of the tree. Scaling can also happen on your water plant, okay? So you have the buildup of these minerals. And over time, that buildup is doing what? Absolutely. And not only does it reduce the diameter capacity of your pipes, what is it doing to the chlorine demand? Okay, it does. It. There is a demand there, which now your residual is doing what? Coming down. So it can be a little more difficult to maintain when you have um, scaling or nodules, tuberculation on those pipes, um, a little more difficult to maintain a residual. So corrosive, also known as aggressive, and I heard that terminology earlier, unstable water, um, will tend to corrode your rust or rust your metal in the pipes or tanks that it passes through. Scale forming water tends to deposit the calcium carbonate on the surface creating the tuberculation. Neither is good, we want to be here. That is ideal, that is our goal. Again, some of the problems with corros corrosive uh, water. Um, we have the eating away of the pipe. Uh, it can cause both economic, because you're going to have to pay in order to clean those periodically, uh, cause health issues as well as aesthetic problems, producing the various coloration, which now stains the plumbing, the clothing, and all of that. So lots of issues uh, centered around corrosive water. We talked about some of the health hazards. Um, some of the metal from the pipe enters the drinking water consumed by the consumer. And as Eric pointed out, because of lead and copper, where is the lead and copper coming from? That's a different way of saying it. Say that first one again for me. What did you say? It's a different pronunciation. Setters. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. Because lead and copper used to be real cheap and easy to get. And so we had lead service lines. We have copper lines. Your solder and flux, again, contain lead. And a lot of people uh, that had the old belt and spigot joints, guess what they're still repairing with? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Brass pipes, for example, are made up of about 7 to 11 percent lead and as much higher percentage of copper. They're so pretty. Oh, and because of that, guess what? New regulation says what? Can't have more than 8 percent or 0.2 percent lead in your solder and uh, flux there. Metals in the waters can be hazardous to the customer health, so we have to keep that in mind. And, you know, I look at this, and as she said, they're so pretty. A lot of things that we used to do, it was because we didn't know the ramification long term. We looked at when chlorine was first introduced as far as a disinfection product. It was the best thing since sliced bread, right? And in the 70s, what did we discover? This is after using it for almost a hundred years. <gasps> yeah. That adding too much was detrimental to our health. 
And how many operators did you know from way back when, don't look around the room or point the finger at yourself, used to operate the more in it, the better serving the public because, hey, there's chlorine in there, not knowing of the possible byproducts that we were building up. And those trihalomethanes and haleacidic acids are now known to cause cancer. But again, so what we've done before without all of this prior, I mean, all of this knowledge after the fact that we're having to uh, now go back and get it right. <laughs> Lead causes a variety of problems in children. Again, increased blood pressure in adults. Mental uh, capabilities is widely reduced. Uh, copper causes stomach intestinal problems. Wilson's disease. And if you have very, very young children, and if you have uh, large amounts of nitrates and nitrites in your water, then that's even exacerbated by that. So you're going to see a much, much, much greater. Uh, I don't know if you know or these guys know, but the lead stuff, I know, like setters, meters, can you, I know you won't be able to purchase any after this year. So is that pretty much just the manufacturers having to follow that, or is it like what I have in stock can go in the ground? Do you know? Do you know? What the rules would be? That's kind of the million be. dollar question right now. Because mm -hmm. we're waiting on clarification from EPA on how we're going to handle it, because the question has been raised, well, what if we take a meter out of the ground and test it? Right. Can we put it back, or exactly. do we have to mm -hmm. replace it? We don't know yet. Because... That's the only way I've been able to afford meters at Lovelessville. And I've got enough to do the entire system, but they're not lead free. So if I get them in before the end of the year, I'm good. <laughs> but are you grandfather just because they're in by the end of the year? I don't know. What we've been told to tell everyone is that, you know, anything that you buy should fall, you know, Right, you're not going to be able to buy anything unless it's lead free now. Yeah. So, I guess what you've got you can use, and as it's tore up, then you won't be able to replace it. And that's anymore. what we're, yeah, we're waiting to hear on the. So, I need to change out have. 50 something meters. And, you know, I don't think you'll have to go, anything that's in the ground, mm -hmm. I don't think that you'll have to take it out and replace it. Right. It's just when you buy new stuff, it's going to mm -hmm. be the lead free stuff. So now Eric is going to go into very, very fast mode to make sure they're all installed by the end of the year. <laughs> yeah. And again, EPA passed the lead and copper rule. Of course, it was passed in 1991 that limit the amount of lead and copper that can be found in your drinking water. All right, aesthetic problems with corrosion, red water. Of course, none of us like to see the red waters, the stain and all of that, to the laundry and plumbing fixtures. Also, it can leave a metallic taste in your mouth, and so you can have customers complaining about that. Okay, what's happening? Now, corrosion in a pipe. We have a negative area, and this is not in your book, but add it just to give you a little more information on corrosion, why it occurs, and how to best combat or give you some alternative means of treatment. We have a negative area of the metal, the anode, and it's connected to the positive area, which is the cathode by the pipe wall itself. So we have three things there in play, anode, the cathode, and the pipe wall. As a result, electrons can flow from the anode to the cathode. Electrochemical reaction requires four different elements to be in contact, um, and that is the anode, the cathode, conductive material, which here would be the pipe walls and the electrolyte, which is the water, and your water may have uh, dissolved salts in it also. Okay, if any of these four elements which make up the corrosion cells are absent, or if they're not touching, corrosion will not occur. But that's not the situation that we have. We have a situation in that pipe wall where you have all four, they're all in contact with each other, hence what? Corrosion. Okay. 
various types of corrosion. We can have internal uh, or external. Uh, corrosion can occur outside the pipe due to corrosive soil. It goes back to, again, where we talked about those dissolved salts in your water. That can also be in your soil or it can be on the inside of the pipe due to the correct corrosive water, which again would be the characteristics of your water. Um, mostly people are concerned with internal corrosion, although external corrosion is a very similar process that can cause problems in your distribution system also. Okay, so each case cause somehow sets up an anode and cathode, so corrosion will occur. So you want to make sure that you look at ways of getting rid of or kind of making sure that contact does not occur to reduce the amount of corrosion that will occur. We want to uh, make sure the creation of the corrosion cell is uh, somewhat interrupted. Now with galvanic corrosion, Metals themselves can also set up corrosive cells when you have dissimilar metals present there. Uh, the pipe consists of one type. Impurities in the wall can develop into anodes and cathodes. Alternatively, you have two dissimilar metals coming in contact, and now you have galvanic corrosion occurring. Um, galvanic corrosion is often set up in the distribution system in meter installations and at service connections and couplings because of the dissimilar metals there. Um, we have a slide which will show based on the type of metals. Uh, they are arranged according to their tendency to corrode. Now one thing we can all do is go out and buy gold and silver pipes and not have a problem. How deep are your pockets? <laughs> yeah. So when you look at this again, the least corrosive would be gold. Kind of be kind of expensive, huh? To set up our distribution system on that. <laughs> yeah, even now with the copper, you're absolutely right. We're having major problems with copper. What are uh, some of the contents in most of our pipes and tanks? Zinc, aluminum, steel, iron, cast iron. And again, as you go up, the more corrosive tendency appears. Is that all of them or PVC? PVC is, uh, is a lot. Well, now, and the other reason is now that they are able to construct it where it's a lot stronger. In years past, the strength was all embedded along the length of a pipe, whereas if something, you know, improper bedding was enough to, you know, kind of shatter it or cut a hole in. But now with the new technology, where it's not only lengthwise, but this way as far as the strength, and you don't have to have those real, real thick walls, we're able to uh, make or manufacture the plastic pipe almost as strong as the cast iron, the ductile iron that's out there. And so that has really changed the material of pipes tremendously. What was the old, the um, C900? Yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, so now technology has drastically improved uh, the plastic pipe where we can widely use it to get away from all of this stuff that is highly corrosive. Okay, galvan uh, galvanized pipe here where you have dissimilar met metals here, uh, dissolving of the metals that damage the pipes and the tanks. And again, again, all this stuff will affect the water quality. So how do we control or how do we get rid of corrosion? Okay. And the first thing that I always tell everybody is to go back to the characteristic of your water. If you go back to the root cause of why corrosion is happening, is it because of the characteristics in the water? And can I change that? Can I stabilize the water? Can I add chemicals to do that? Can I, you wanna make sure you're treating the root cause. Is it coming from that? Is it coming from my distribution system? Is it the pipes in my distribution system? Now again, I know one uh, entity, territory, uh, they are desalinating their water. 
and coming out of the plant, the water looks a-okay. But the moment it goes into the distribution system because of all the ductile cast iron pipes, that's where the corrosion and the red water is coming from. So the treatment process is a-okay, but it's the old pipes that's been around for almost 100 years that need repair. But the bottom line is their customers are getting water all in some cases, and this came directly from their mouths, 40 parts per million iron. Yeah, yeah. that looks like mud. That's very hot. But they're proving it's not coming from our, you know, from the production, it's from the system. So they've gone through the process where they are literally changing out the pipes. But they hadn't totally gotten around to complete change out. Matter of fact, one group was so angry because it looked like they got to one section and just stopped. And because of that, every that's the water that they're getting for drinking. So. <laughs> yeah, so identify what the source is, and from the source or from the root cause of the corrosion, these are some alternatives to correcting the issue. Protective coatings in your pipes, okay? Your ductile cast iron pipes can be lined with PVC or some type of, again, non corrosive uh, material would be one thing uh, you can put there. We can use sacrificial end nodes, and we'll talk more about each of these in detail too. Um, cathodic protection, which is an electrochemical method of protecting the, uh, water, uh, the tank walls underneath the water or where the water is. But however, with cathodic protection, and that is putting in the sacrificial end nodes, the tank above the water level is not protected. And you can use chemical treatment. Now out of all of these, probably the easiest to implement would be which one? Yeah, and that's what a lot of us do like the chemical risk management plan, the easy way out. Um, chemical treatment, sodium silicate, polyphosphate, lime, soda ash. Now, if we're adding polyphosphates or the sodium silicate, are we removing the problem? No. Toting it. Where are you from? Where are you from? Uh huh. Where is that? Is that in Kentucky? Yeah. He he really has a southern twain. This is the first class I've been to. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which makes me feel like I'm at home so thank you because I've been hearing all these northerners for so long yeah. no I like it it makes me feel like hey I'm I'm in you know territory where I feel safe yeah I'm in the south I've been up north for the last few classes and it's and yeah it's a totally different sound all right, so chemical treatment with the polyphosphate and the uh, sodium silicate. Again, note that you're not getting rid of the problem. Um, masking, or what did you say that we're doing? Just coating it. Coating it. Coating it. Yeah, coating it, uh, sequestering it. And so, very simple to do, but know that the issue is still there. With the lime, the soda ash, what are we doing there? Raising the pH, very good. Okay, what time do we have? 11.30. 11.30. Is it time for lunch already? Yeah, 12, 12 o'clock. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's look at the different methods of uh, dealing with corrosion. Gavanic uh, corrosion, again, if you know you have two metals, that are causing the corrosion, you can separate them. Um, dielectric couplings can be utilized to separate them. Um, these couplings can be plastic, ceramic, or other non-conductive sections uh, put between the two different types of metals where there is no contact. You've gotten rid of the problem there. 
Uh, again, the electrodes cannot flow through the coupling. It breaks the, cir the circuit, so therefore corrosion does not happen. Cathodic protection. Here we're going to introduce a sacrificial anode or introduce a different electrical circuit in the pipe. It's a piece of very active metal, usually zinc or mag magnesium. It's uh, more galvanically active than any other metal in the system. If you remember again, they were at the very top of that list up there as far as corrosive. So what's happening to that anode? It corrodes instead of the pipe itself. And that's why we call it the sacrificial anode. So you're going to have to replace. That's the maintenance that you're going to have to do with that from time to time. You can do it that way there. Usually these are used with water tanks more so than with pipes, though. Yeah. And so they can be easily gotten to, and you want to make sure that maintenance every so often that those are replaced. In your tank? And they check it once a year. Okay. They have to replace some of those. Yeah, yeah, they have to be replaced because the whole thing is we know that they are going to corrode. We prefer this little part to corrode rather than our tank. So it's more widely used in tanks than with pipes. What's generally used with pipes would be the linings or the coatings. So sacrificial anodes are also used on like warships and cruisers. Mm. Okay. Excellent. Okay. With the cathodic protection, your sacrificial anodes would be the only metal corroded. Now, this right here, I kind of get leery when they start saying only and always and never uh, because depending on the amount that's being corroded here, you may have some corrosion still occurring. And again, if we look back at the rules and regs on an annual basis, regardless of what we have in place to prevent corrosion, we're doing inspections of our tanks, right? Right? Yeah. Uh, absolutely, yeah. I like that. Absolutely. Uh, active anodes on the pipe wall will become cathodes and thus be protective. Your sacrificial will slowly corrode away and must be replaced at, again, different intervals, which means you need to have a maintenance program, <coughs> preventative maintenance program set up to ch keep check on that. Um, iron and manganese removal. Oh, what type of iron is it? <laughs> if we have bacterial iron, okay, and again, that can show up as clumps or streams of reddish color slimes. If it's iron bacteria, will it lead to corrosion? Will I still have the same uh, characteristics in my water as a corroded pipe? And so I need to make sure I understand where my red water is coming from, or rust colored water is coming from. Um, we've already have established as far as aeration goes that when you aerate water, it can help with removal of iron as well as manganese and some of the other gases because it literally oxidizes the iron making it come out of solution where, again, we can filter it out. So, in a scenario where you're using aeration and you may be using chlorination to aid the process, you want to make sure chlorine goes in before you adjust the pH. We are adding chlorine once you zap that chlorine in it, pH will be further reduced, right? Because chlorine is an acid. Once you add chlorine to the water, two acids are formed, hydrochloric acid and hypochlorous acid. So it's going to drop the pH level of that water, but it's helping to take that iron out. We then adjust that pH back up. So chlorination should have happened before. Now you want to be leery also if you have problems with organics with the addition of chlorine throughout the process. Because the more chlorine you add, especially in a situation where you're adding chlorine 
have the iron to drop out and let's say your pH coming in is at a four or five or something like that you have all this excess of chlorine and you have organic matter you've just created what those byproducts which quite a few states are being hit with those as I'm going from state to state that's a major issue trihalomethanes and haley acidic acid so if you're going to use chlorine use it with caution or use an alternative method because then people say well what else does a better job than chlorine Gotta do your due diligence and do do your background work. Okay, there are other options that are out there, um, and then of course it depends on the level too of iron you may have or the manganese that you may have, whether or not it's chlorine is even an option or if something else can be better better serve you, such as your chemical, your phosphates, and all of that. And then filtration. Now, superchlorination and flushing can help control the bacterial iron problems in well. We use chlorination for the iron bacteria because it is a bacteria. And chlorine does what to organic organisms? Okay, and if it doesn't kill them, it destroys their ability to reproduce. Okay? Sequestering agents, again, use when iron and manganese levels are below one milligrams per liter. Is that where your iron falls? But if it's higher than that, then your polyphosphates or your, your silicates may not be as effective. Uh, polyphosphates are used to tie up these compounds, but as we said earlier, it does not remove them. Um, you want to keep materials uh, bound to the poly. And again, it's added before chlorination if you're going to use polyphosphate. And when you use these compounds, you must report the dosage that you are using or the residual that goes on your report, your monthly report. And if you get in a situation where you're doing the increased frequency and you're doing the water quality parameters every two weeks, um, this was with the uh, lead and copper. Remember, you're going to have to report that information to uh, the, the dosage, the residual of your polys every two weeks, or no less than every two weeks that you're pulling it. Bessie, can you tell me again why you would add that before chlorination? Why you would add this like before? Uh, because the iron levels are so low, I don't need the chlorine in this case to oxidize because what the chlorine generally is used for when you have very very high levels of iron it helps to oxidize it uh, where it drops out of that particular state but here since I'm dealing with low levels chlorination is, is usually not needed at this point in order to achieve that and I'm reducing the possibility of those formations say my injection points, one's here and one's here. So what difference does it make if they're only, that, you know what I'm saying? Is this pretty much for clear wells we're talking about before, as far as chlorinating before? A lot of people, as far as the polyphosphate, I've seen cases where it's coming directly from the well and they are injecting it there. Well. After the well. We have right, before their treatment process. Uh huh. Um, it's the last. It's thing. part of the last it's before the clear well. The right. Okay. But that's why I'm saying it's the last it. one in my line, but from here to here, There's you know, much, I've right. got four yeah. chemicals going in. So does it matter if it's in right here or right here? Does it really matter? But it right. does change the chemistry. Which yeah. one goes in first, though? I Go I ahead, ma'am. Okay, and this is coming from again. There's an iron problem with right. my groundwater. That's, that's interesting. Yeah, I hadn't seen that set up before. Like I said, the only way we use it here in Kentucky is it's, that, it's the last thing added before it hits the distribution. <coughs> right, as but a protection there to tie it. It's to protect the, you know, the pipe. 
steps. Right. The but as far so, as using it to tie up the compounds as a treatment process, we haven't... Hadn't seen that scenario? Okay. Yeah. So it is one option if you're having that issue coming out of the ground. Right. He sets them up, but that's He's what I was like. Is actually the, the chemical supplier is the one that you know. As far as the polyphosphates, it's uh -huh. for a treatment process. It's pretty much help lead copper. Mm. It prevents the leaking. Okay. Okay. Now, any any setup that you have that's not, or that you go back and say, well, I want to try this. Before you make any changes, you want to make sure that you contact who? Your state agency for approval. Yeah, don't do anything until you get their stamp of approval and have something to back up the reason why you're making this change. Okay, you got to make sure. It just gives more ammunition for them to say, okay, go ahead, go for it. So make sure you know the whys behind it. All right, for uh, softening, hardness in the water can increase the soap needs to produce a lather and cause scaling in the boilers. Now, is this a health issue, hard water? Generally, it's not. And generally, you know what we say as utilities? <laughs> We're going to leave that to the homeowner to invest in softening the water because it can get to be quite expensive when you look at the large qualities, quantities of waters that we are treating. Um, very, very expensive. Um, it's caused mostly by calcium and magnesium. Again, these are minerals that are found in the layers of soil or what have you. Also, iron and manganese can contribute to hard uh, water. So the treatment uh, could be softening by, again, adding chemicals, lime, calcium oxide, Ion exchange can be used, but now we start talking about dollars when you start looking at ion exchange. Usually, again, when you're looking at ion exchange, you're probably changing it out with the sodium. So now your final product will be what? Can taste kind of salty. And if you ever buy water, bottled water, that's um, produced by ion exchange, usually there's a salty taste, in my opinion, to it. Reverse osmosis can also be used. Now you're t really talking expense. Reverse osmosis is probably one of the best treatment out there to remove any and everything. Even a lot of your radioactive chemicals, reverse osmosis can handle it. But how much are you willing to invest to produce that clean, sterile water? And the waste product from your reverse osmosis process. In the past, it was more than the product that you were producing. Now, because of technology, that's been greatly reduced to only about 20 to 40 percent waste product. And then what do you do with all that concentrate that's being produced? Got to have a permit if you're going to discharge it. So those are things that you kind of think about. What's my best way in order to rectify my problem? Lime and soda ash can also be used to uh, soften the water. Ion exchange, again, an ion is an atom, a group of atoms, which has an electrical charge, negatively charged ions or anions, positive or cations. Ion exchange reduce calcium and magnesium. Um, and again, usually that is replaced with the sodium ion when you're doing that exchange. All right, if you have problems with arsenic, fluoride, lead, mercury, nitrate, silver, how do you remove those things that can be naturally occurring? Because in some cases, arsenic is naturally occurring. Other cases, it may be where someone's dumped something and it's leached out into my groundwater system. But 80% of the time, radioactive material will come from what naturally occurring things. So how do we remove <coughs> those things? How do we get rid of those things? That's where those special processes come into play 
and the degree of treatment is based on the quality of your water. And you start looking at all those things such as some type of filtration, reverse osmosis uh, for removal. You all don't have a fluoride issue, you're not fluoridating. Uh, in some states, fluoride is added to uh, promote healthy teeth. Uh, they add it in sodium fluoride, sodium silico fluoride, hydrofluoric silic acid. Uh, in some cases, you have too much naturally occurring fluoride, so they put in the activated aluminum beds or reverse osmosis for removal. Um, fluoride is the only contaminant that appears on both lists, both the primary as well as the secondary. Primary maximum contaminant level is four milligrams per liter. On your secondary list, it's two milligrams per liter. Why? Well, when you start getting above two, it causes the mottling of the teeth, which is a brown staining. Elevated uh, levels above that, especially above four, now you start having the pitting of your teeth. So it is one, depending on where you fall naturally, you may be adding it, not at all, or trying to remove it. Reverse osmosis is a treatment process to uh, remove heavy metals. Um, your total dissolved solid, sulfate, sodium, or alkalinity. Um, here, water is forced through a membrane under pressure. Um, the membrane, membrane retains your dissolved solids, compounds, microorganisms. As far as treatment technique, as I said earlier, this is probably one of the better ones. It rejects the larger particles into waste, but now we have a concentrated waste that we have to know exactly how we're going to get rid of it or what we're going to do to treat it. Uh, so they can be expensive to operate. Any of you all with reverse osmosis? None? I was um, talking earlier to Bart, and it was interesting when I was in the Virgin Islands they seem to have a redundancy of uh, treatment processes in place. They have chlorination, they have your reverse osmosis, and some of them have filters also. And yet, their confidence in the water is very, very low. Yeah. With all of that redundancy. Now, there are some other issues too, though. <laughs> Uh huh. So it probably tastes like awful. The water? It probably tastes awful, which is, you know, that, that's your biggest perception of your water is taste. It's taste. So, so and, and the public, they don't really care how you clean it. Yeah. It just tastes bad, so it must be bad. Yeah, one of the issues there also is that not a lot of them, even with the redundancy, their public do not believe in the chlorination. They don't like the chlorine taste, okay? So that was an issue on, on one side, the reason they don't add as much, but they still have to add in order to meet the monthly requirements because they were having back to issues also. Um, so that was an issue. Now with the desalination, the plant, it was okay, but they had the pipe system. They were the ones now letting the cat out the bag that had the pipe system that was in such a disarray that the distribution system was actually causing more havoc than the treated water itself. And then a very high production of trihalomethanes and haleacidic acid because they were chlorinating, they were producing this. It's a rainforest type of situation where it was again rain capture and they had cisterns and you had all this detritus leaves and bird poop and everything else. They even said rat, and I didn't want to go there. And I'm like, rats? Yeah, rat droppings. Getting down in their cistern system. And because the EPA does not mandate disinfection or chlorination disinfection, but as necessary, they were doing batch chlorination. So every time there's a heavy rain, put five gallons. Oh, and so you talk about all the free chlorine, the production of all these issues. So again, it was very interesting to go from place to place to see what the thought process is. 
um, because it, literally they were creating the halomethanes and the um, haleocytic acids by the process itself. A lot of times we can change the process and the dosage applied and get a different result. And doing your investigation, you need to look at all of that in order to, again, rectify your problem area. It's the reason I say if you have an iron problem, what is the root cause? And based on the root cause, you want to build in, okay, how do we rectify that? But you have to get to the root cause. And we were able to track. You know, the batch dosing may not be the best thing that you need to do. How about putting in a pump? doing a continuous where you can maintain a certain residual that's not sky high and that could be based on flow. How about in addition to that having some type of a, and I think it was called memory come back and serve me first dump and I know that sounds real cruddy but first dump is this type of system where the first rain is actually dumped out and not does not go in your system and therefore all the concentrated stuff that may have been on your roof is discarded before you start filling your cistern and you're not getting all the leaves and things like that. So that's what we're about, going out and giving solution after we've discovered what's the problem. Okay, Then we can work together to get you at a solution. So reverse osmos osmosis is always an option. Surface water influence for groundwater systems that again we saw pictures earlier where you had the groundwater system and then you had a lake or ocean or a river sitting very close and there could be some intrusion of the surface water into your groundwater sources. Or you could have a well that was not properly installed and again you got the runoff from the surface where your cattle's kept and all this poop getting into your well source, another possibility. Whenever you have surface water and it's influencing your groundwater, now you need to make sure that you do the um, survey to see if your groundwater is under the direct influence of surface water. And we call these facilities GUIs, groundwater under the influence of surface water. Uh, we want to do the study to see what the impact on the groundwater is from the shallow well, uh, from the river source or water source. Um, we look at the surface water treatment rule because that's where we see how to do the surveys to see if it is. And what I'm looking for mainly is every time there is a change in my weather or rainfall and things like that, does the quality of my groundwater change? Does my pH do this? My alkalinity change whenever there's a shift in the outside water? If so, that's indicating, hey, I may have some surface water coming in. Do I now have microorganisms and I didn't have them in the past? I may have an influx of surface water. Is there Giardia? What is Giardia? You are very good. Now, who are you again, Miss Barb? I've got too many experiences. Okay. Because they jumped on that bacteria and viruses very fast. And, and that was a good catch. Very good catch. So, Giardia, we're concerned about, again, carried by warm blooded animals. It can get into our surface water source through runoff and get into our groundwater if it's under the influence. Cryptosporidium is another one. Now, Giardia in Texas is, oh, we have a lot of it in our soil. Now, what's unique about Giardia and Cryptosporidium is that they are resistant to chlorine. So, if I mandate it just to chlorinate, Am I ridding myself of the problem of Giardia and Cryptosporidium? I am not. I am not. So now that mandated chlorination for groundwater does nothing if I'm under the influence of surface water. Now why should I be concerned if a few little bad bacteria, protozoas, get through? What's it going to hurt? 
Well, Superbugs, Milwaukee, 1993. What happened? Yeah, over 400,000, 403,000 were affected. Okay, over 100 died. So if I'm young, if I'm kind of on the elderly side, or if I have a compromised immune system, then I'm highly susceptible to any of these things that we're talking about. Healthy individuals can probably uh, weather the storm and be okay. But whenever anything that we're producing hurts any of the people that we're providing water to, it's a big issue. It's a big issue. And we want to protect the masses. How do we protect the masses? By protecting those that are the weakest. So we're looking out for the young, the elderly, and the compromised immune system. If we can give them a product that does not adversely affect them, we're good to go. So we're doing this study to see, or survey to see, if we have Giardia cryptosporidium showing up in our groundwater source. Now, in addition to chlorination, which does nothing, we have to employ the surface water treatment scheme, which now involves removal of these organisms. And generally, removal is achieved by filtration, some type of filtration. So we evaluate the surface water influence. We determine if it's there. We must then change our treatment scheme. Again, we're working with our state agency on all of this in order to implement it. Okay, are there any questions? <laughs> Comments? Concerns or issues on groundwater production? None? No comments? Is there a way to get a copy of the slides to supplement what's in the book? I will check. Matter of fact, at lunch I'll call and check. I don't, again, it's below my pay grade to say yes or nay, but uh, did they send you all the, the slides? No? Not that I'm aware of. Not that you're aware of. I know we have a very generic slide show that sometime is given out, but I'll have to have clearance before I can say yes or no on that. We'll find out yeah. if they send us. Okay. Good deal. That's, that's above my country. That's yeah. above our state. It's yeah. way above ours. I know in the state they're very, very on their slides and all. But I, I will, I'll call the boss and see on that. 